<laughs> Be on your best behavior now, fellas. We are live with the Reinhardt Archives, and we got something really exciting tonight. Seth, what do we have? <clears throat> yes, sir. I got this tape from you, as a matter of fact, a few weeks ago when I was in Raleigh. Um, this is um, something I hadn't heard, and I just put it on the player tonight just to see what it was. And here comes uh, Ernie Knight announcing an interview with Don Reno and Red Smiley from the year of 1962. Yeah, that is pretty cool. I, I thought that was pretty neat when I heard that, and I, I told you earlier, I said, this is what we got to play. It's um, pretty epic stuff. Don't know if it's ever been heard before. I don't did you get these tapes from Ernie himself, Jan? It's from Ernie's collection. I, I got it from uh, another source. But over the years, I, you know, we became pretty good friends, Ernie and I. And then he, he was generous with, you know, letting me have the CD copy. He did a lot of taping, taping of festivals, you know, and, and uh, you know. Yeah. Well, we've got... Um a, a special guest with us tonight, Jeremy uh, Stevens. He's pretty much a Reno authority, and uh, glad to have him. How are you doing tonight, Jeremy? I'm doing great. I really appreciate y'all having me on here tonight. Yeah. So, so, Jeremy, you're from Danville? That's correct. Originally, I'm from Danville, Virginia. Yeah. Well, I, I spent spent a lot of time in Danville, and in but the only gig I ever get anymore is this annual beer fest in in uh, in Danville, thanks to Henry Walker. Okay. And that's a pretty wild event. You know, you want to get the early spots because, you know, by 8, 9 in the evening, that crowd is going to be hooting and hollering pretty bad. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I don't know if I'm even familiar with that event, but... Uh... It's uh, it's uh, it's down there in one of the old uh, factory. It's like an old storage, huge storage building. Gotcha. So okay. Old, old, uh, you know, probably, I'd say maybe 1800s or early 1900s. So it's beautiful. They really All fixed right. up that part of town. That's a common thing here around where I live in, in this part of North Carolina is turning those old factories and warehouses into some kind of venue uh, yeah we played most of the ones most of the ones in Danville they they tore down and sold the bricks but there's a few of them still around there yeah. they have done some revitalization so. yeah it's really 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 nice oh. okay so uh we, let's just play this and uh, jason i mean jeremy who who was in the band at this time around 1962 do you know yeah, 1962, uh, Reno and Smiley's band uh, was comprised, of course, of Don Reno and Red Smiley, but also Mac McGahey, John Palmer, mm -hmm. Ronnie Reno. I believe Ronnie was in the band at the time, and also um, Steve Chapman. Uh, not sure how much Steve was actually traveling with the group, but uh, but he was definitely as a part of the band at the time. So, so. In '62, they were based where Asheville or? Oh, they were in Roanoke, Virginia. Okay, that's right. That's right. WDPJ. Yes. Yeah, that's some powerful, powerful uh, Go Kroger show there. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, well, let, let's just uh, listen to it. We, we let's and then we can find some music from this era that we can play. Yeah, hey, Jan, before we play that, um, we didn't introduce Dan. Dan Anderson came on with us tonight. We're glad to have him. Yeah, absolutely. Hey. Originally from uh, North Wiltsboro is Dan. And uh, he pulled up there near, uh, <clears throat> near Doc Watson. Okay. Dan, you were saying something about Doc Watson just the other day. That oh, yeah. he was pretty, you know, uh, you had some people in your family who knew him well. or Yeah, my, my aunt and my mother had been raised around his his wife, Rosalie. Yeah. And uh, different ones, you know, they, they're they from a place called Summit. 
which is Pelier. Is that, who's giving this feedback? I well, I, I don't know. Are you having? You muted your mic. Yeah, I think we're good now. Yeah, Dan, you muted your mic. Yeah, I muted it because I thought I was causing some kind of feedback. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to play this real quick. Yeah. I think we're all set to go if that works. Okay, cool. The sort of added attraction to the country music show this afternoon. I want to welcome Don Reno and Ritz. There's a lot of cough in there. He stopped it. Well, you know, it was running <clears throat> fast. Too, yeah. too fast. <laughs> Hang on, Jan. I've got to fix uh, something here. I didn't have my monitor on to listen to how this is coming out. So just bear with me one second. Hey, yeah, well, I'll say that uh, while we're filling air, empty air, uh, you know, Don Reno went to Taylorsville. There's that sound. Don Didn't Reno went, went to Taylorsville uh -huh. and got on stage with uh, Bill Monroe without being asked. Just got up there and started playing. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bill liked it and kept him, you know, because Earl was gone. He had heard Earl and left. Yeah, well, now, that's the story. <coughs> I, you know. Don yeah, played he, with Monroe before Scruggs. Right. He auditioned with Scruggs, uh, with uh, Monroe in 1943. Right. And, and had uh, to go to the military, yeah. That's yeah, right. It was in Merrill's Marauders, you know, yeah. behind the line in the special troops in the Pacific Theater. Uh, Jeremy, you probably know all about that. I, I've not done a whole lot of research on his wartime. Yeah. Uh, I've, you know, really a lot of those records have to be gotten from through family, and I haven't talked to any of them about doing that, but. You know, Don mentioned that he was in horse cavalry, which, uh, you know, that wasn't a very large outfit in World War II. But my understanding is they were like reinforcements for Merle's Marauders. But uh, oh, OK, yeah. well, you know, they were sort of famous. For right. You U.S. had 100,000 or more horses in World War Two. OK. Germany had a million. <laughs> yeah. They, wow. They, all the, I mean, the majority of the German artillery were, was horse drawn. Pretty okay, Jan, I think I'm all ready if we're okay. ready to try this. Okay. Yes, sir. Riley, the songs of the hills and plains. Thank you, Aaron, and I had a pleasure visiting with you here in Greensboro, North Carolina, back to the age where the big show is taking place, and we're proud to be visiting with you and your fans over at WLOE here in Lynchburg, North Carolina. Well, thank you, John. It's mighty proud to have you. Uh, on the show this afternoon. I play a lot of Don Reno and Red Smiley records and enjoy them very much. How are you, Red? Hi, Ernie. It's always a pleasure to visit with you fine disc jockeys throughout the country and especially here at WLOE in Leakesville, North Carolina. We certainly hope that the neighbors out there will stay tuned and and uh, listen and send all the requests in for the good country songs that we know that you play here on the station. And thanks very much for playing the Reno Smiley. Well, I'm mighty glad to play them because I enjoy them very much. Uh, I enjoy the bluegrass music a great deal more than most folks do. And I play a great deal more bluegrass than a lot of the disc jockeys simply well, we, because I enjoy it. We appreciate it. And folks all over the nation are now beginning to realize what uh, bluegrass music really is. It's the backbone of the uh, United States of America and the land which we love to live in. How long have you been playing the five-string banjo, Don Reno? Well, I started playing the banjo at a very early age, about uh, six or seven years old. I reckon I started picking the banjo. And, uh, of course, uh, I don't remember exactly how many years it, it is exactly, Ernie. I started at a very early age playing, I know, and switched between guitar and banjo and this, that, and the other. It was kind of hard to find instruments back when I was a kid. In other words, you play a variety of instruments even now. Well, I play out a variety of instruments. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, you do a, certainly do a fine job on the five-string banjo. I enjoy it very much. 
uh, enjoy this album of instrumentals a great deal. Well, thank you, Ernie. And uh, I'd like to mention an album that's coming out that uh, you will probably enjoy and a lot of your listeners. It's 15 top hymns of the world compiled and edited by the Chicago Tribune. A nationwide search was made to find out which were the most popular hymns that were used and sung in churches the entire world over. And we had the pleasure of recording the top 15 about a month or two ago. The album should be out now in a very short time. Well, I think that's very nice, very nice. I always enjoy your good inspirational songs, too. Well, we enjoy recording uh, inspirational songs, I believe, more so than we do anything else, Ernie. And especially this uh, album of hymns happened to hit a bunch of our old favorite songs mm -hmm. that we used to sing when we were kids in church, such uh, songs as Amazing Grace, uh, Where We'll Never Grow Old, Precious Memories, and the number one hymn in the entire world is The Old Rugged Cross, which I'm sure everyone is familiar <laughs> with. Well, tell me one that you'd like to hear right now, and we'll spin it. Well, let's see, Ernie. Let's uh, pull back in uh, the hymn file and play one called Whispering Hope. Good enough. Now, uh, what I, uh, Red, how long have you and Don been together? Well, Don and myself have been together since 1950. Uh, so that'd be about 13 years, I guess, now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been uh, in the business for, I've been in the business for 19 years. Of course, Don and myself have just been together for 13 of the years. Mm -hmm. And you still make Roanoke, Virginia, your headquarters now? That's right. We still, uh, we've in Roanoke, and we've been there about seven years, I believe, now. And, of course, we have been in practically every state in the Union in the last uh, eight months. And home hadn't been the same. <laughs> well, how in the world do you manage all the traveling and still keeping uh, your local uh, programs satisfied? And Well, we, we do a lot of uh, videotape. Of course, uh, neighbors that watch our television shows uh, say they can't uh, know the difference. But uh, we do a lot of videotape on television. And, of course, we do a lot of our... Uh, shows live too. A lot of times we're up there. We're not very live, mm -hmm. but we're there. You have to get up early yeah, in the morning. Up there. <laughs> That's right. It seems that would be mighty hard to manage if you're out so late doing personal appearances. Well, the best thing to do is not even go to bed, and then you don't have to get up. So that the way. You don't have any problem That's at all. That's the way that I whipped it. Well, Red, what are some of your uh, plans for the immediate future? Well, uh, we are booked up through uh, September, pretty much so now. And uh, we only have about uh, 13 dates open, I believe, between now and the last of September. So that uh, keeps us pretty busy. We're in uh, Ojai, Indiana, uh, New York, and uh, all the New England states and some of the southern states. We go down into Florida uh, in June and Mississippi, Alabama, and uh, practically all the states this side of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Well, now, do you have some, uh, of course, uh, Don told me about this new album you have of hymns. Do you have any new single records coming out in the near future? Uh, the latest one I have is this instrumental, Grandfather's Well, Ernie, Clock. we do have a new single release coming out. It should be on the market now. One side is just about this. It's a short-lived interview, Jan, but that's uh, that's what we got. Okay, so uh, let's just grab another tape. Well, um, let's ask Jeremy a few questions here. Yeah, yeah, let's let's do that, and let me see if I can find another tape here while uh, we talk about Reno and Smiley there. Yeah, what, what, Jeremy, what what do they travel in? Well, I think about that time they had a flexible bus that they were uh, traveling in that uh, had their uh, Kroger sponsorship on the uh, on the side of the bus. There's a few pictures out there oh, okay. of that bus, I think. I was going to mention this interview, I believe, is actually from 1963 because they actually recorded that album April 8th and 9th of 63. So oh, that yeah. might be... Okay. something interesting to know i don't know where 62 uh if that was written on the tape or whatnot but uh, yeah i think i think it was 
Yeah. We have ask Seth. But there are several tapes there, you know, there is a uh, Red Allen's or something with Red Allen. I don't know what it is. So but uh maybe Seth could do while you're well let's let's say something about Don Reno's interview. Because I only spoke to Don Reno once. He was the nicest guy you could ever talk to. Yeah. Mm. And he was very, just like he was there, very cordial, well-spoken. I yeah. remember asking him how he didn't lose his finger picks. <laughs> and yeah. he pulled them out and he said, I've had these since the beginning. He'd never lost one. Is that amazing or what? Yeah. Don, wow. Don Reno, I'm, I like to bring up Bob Hoffman, Professor Bob Hoffman from Raleigh, a <laughs> big bluegrass fan who's now departed this world. But Don used to say Don was superior to his instrument. He he was he you know he could do everything a banjo could do and then more and mm. Uh, mm. he was quite a talent. He played jazzy. He, he was ahead of his time. I mean, the sort of jazz guitar lines on, on the banjo. He yeah he did. He tried that double speed. I forget what he called it. Yeah. I didn't much go for that, but uh, he he was an innovator. No, oh, absolutely. Jason, I mean Jeremy. I'm, I'm sorry for calling you Jason. You know. But <clears throat> what, the, where, where did Reno's origin, I mean, was he playing some kind of three-finger style like Scruggs at some point? I think I've read that. Well, Don's early style, I, from the recordings I've heard and all, didn't differ greatly from what you would call sort of his straight playing later on. You know, his three-finger role was indeed three-finger. He's been claimed of early on played two finger uh i think that was extremely early on i think by you know anytime he was playing with any groups like the morris brothers in 38 and 39 he was he was playing three finger by then uh but his roles were very uh forward role oriented um maybe to some they you know would say didn't have that real strong drive like earl scruggs is playing did but it's, uh, you know, there's some recordings of, of Don with Monroe in, in 48 and 49, and it's really good. You know, I mean, it's it's all forward roll, um, and it's not the real syncopated, um, uh, strong drive type of sound that, that Earl had necessarily. But it's uh, but it's a strong it's a strong forward roll, and it, it still drives, you know, in its own way. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, how did you get uh, into Reno and Smiley? And well, I played with um, some guys about my age growing up. We we started uh, a local music teacher there in Danville. Um, uh, Lee Latcham is her name. I Lee Latcham, actually, I know her well. <laughs> yeah, so she was. I think she's in Raleigh area. Yeah, now she, or is in, she is in Raleigh. I I talked to her just a week ago or texted. Yeah, so uh, I was actually taking some fiddle lessons from her at the time, and a few mm -hmm. of these other guys had taken lessons from her, and she decided to start what she called a boy band. <laughs> <laughs> and in November of 94, we, she got us together in her basement, and that sort of started the band. And we, we played together until I moved um, to Nashville in 2010. And, you know, we just kind of played different stuff when we started. But somewhere along when I was about uh, 11 or 12 years old, which was in 95, 96, um, I, I was all into Earl. You know, I didn't really know anything about Don Reno. But uh, one of the guys in the band, his name is Mark Hudson, he brought me this book where it talked about the Scruggs Review and how they, the music they did and all that stuff. And I read that and I said, I'm done with Earl Scruggs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at 12 years old, you know, I'm here's here's me saying stuff like that. <laughs> anyway, he had just gotten the Reno and Smiley box set, all their recordings from 1951 to 59, which yeah. encompassed the stuff with Tommy Magnus from 51. Mm -hmm. And uh, he played that for me. I said, man, I love Don Reno. And I was just Don Reno gung ho from then on, you know. Yeah. And uh, of course, I have great respect for Earl Scruggs and all that he did. Uh awesome. Sure. And you know, have actually learned a lot of his music in in yeah. more recent years as well. But that's sort of how I got onto Reno, and I, 
a guy that was a mentor to me uh, named Troy Brammer. He's up in uh, the Martinsville area. Mm -hmm. uh, he was friends with Don and uh, played some single string stuff uh, really before Don. There's some recordings of him way back in the early 50s. Uh -huh. And um, and he and Don were friends at that time when Don was playing with, with Tommy Magnus. And uh, so I just had connection with him and, and – uh, just got really interested in all, all that, that sort of thing. And, you know, the uh, sort of what got me into a lot of this research and stuff was um, uh, Troy uh, told me that he, that Don had told him at some point that he had a picture of them together when um, they had first met at the El Tenador skating rink up outside of Floyd, Virginia in about 1950 or so. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'd like to find that picture. He said, Don always told me he had that picture at home. So I started getting with the family and collecting their photos. And mm -hmm. one thing led to another. And I started doing interviews. And, you know, I did about, I've done about 50 or so interviews uh, with different folks all over the place about uh, Don Reno. Haven't gotten anywhere, you know, into writing a book yet, though I've been claiming to do that for a long time, but just you haven't. Should. You should. Please. So uh, that's kind of how all that went. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy, I know we've talked about this before. What do you think, and a lot of these recordings were great, but what do you think probably the best or some of the top recordings that Don Reno ever did were? Well, you know, uh, as far as showcasing his own uh, singing ability and, and his own playing, uh, his, I guess, really his only, like, what you would say, solo album which was done for Monument Records in uh, 65 or, or early 66, somewhere along in there, or maybe both. I think the sessions encompassed both of those years. Um, that record is called A Song for Everyone. And boy, you can't, you get everything Don Reno on that. Every, every lick he had, he was throwing it into that record. And uh, his singing is great. His playing is great. Um, I just really, really love that album. Yeah, I, I think it's it. a great showcase of his his playing and singing. <clears throat> yeah, I had that album handy. I just put it up here on the screen. So there, yeah, there it is. Um, I, I loved uh, Benny Martin's fiddle playing too on that album. That was pretty. Cool. Yes, Benny's only on two songs on that record, but uh, uh, he cut four. There's a 45 that has the other two on it. Uh, but yeah, Benny's playing on five by eight on that is great. And Soldier's yep. Prayer in Vietnam. Oh, sheesh, it's so. He was supposed to be on the whole record, but uh, they parted ways, and uh, they finished the album with um, Benny Williams, which Benny was good, but he wasn't he, he wasn't Benny Martin. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I was uh, just looking at that picture of that album again since I put it up. There, that's an interesting uh, armrest that Don's got on there. It's not a Gibson armrest. I never well, know. it, it is. It's it's RB18 armrest. Oh, okay. So it's a top tension armrest. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, well, that that's, that's sort of his his classic setup there uh, with the Gretsch tailpiece and uh, and that uh, that RB18 armrest. Uh, that armrest was still in the family. Don Wayne uh, had it and um, he uh, encountered some fellow that that had an 18 but didn't have an armrest for all we know it could have actually been the armrest it was on that banjo but anyway he sold it to the guy so it's back on a, an original 18 now somewhere that's interesting one yeah. thing that i always noticed too on a lot of don's um album pictures and whatnot was his um, truss rod cover up there at the headstock would be right turned around i always liked the way that looked to be honest with you I know. I don't know why he did that, but uh, it was interesting. <laughs> what did he do? Yeah. So the truss rod cover on on banjos you know, kind of looks like a bell, and uh, Don he would uh, on a lot of these albums you look at. If you look at his truss rod cover, it's up upside down. It's the other way. It's like an upside down bell. All right. I actually heard from uh, it was Curtis McPeak one time told me he talked to Don about that and said that. Uh, Don told him, he said, I just wanted to try that to see if people would, would copy that. And he said, sure enough, at festivals, he would see people with that turned around. I don't know if that's true, but that's what Curtis told me at one time. That's funny. I understand Curtis isn't doing too well right now. Yeah, that's what I heard. Uh, 
I don't know some, something health wise, but uh, I don't know any more details than that. So, same here. Yeah. 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 I uh, recently posted uh, a show with uh, Curtis playing with Flat and Scr well Lester Flat because Earl was in the hospital. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That was, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, I had a friend of mine tell me one time that he went, well, you and I know him, Jan, Ronnie. He went to, uh, Ronnie Smith, he went to a drive-in movie theater back in the 60s. And uh, they had a uh, the preview shows that they would do before the actual movie played. They played a clip of... Uh, Flatten Scruggs, of course, without Scruggs and Curtis McPeak playing the banjo. He said he'll never forget that. I know. Pretty powerful. Well, I know. Let's see. Uh, Tom Langdon, he, he he told me he saw Reno and Smiley somewhere in like Smithfield or some town east of here. Dan, did you ever, you ever see them live anywhere? No, I did not. No, they were, uh, they they were uh, performing in, in uh, this bit. Well, Jason, I mean Jeremy. I'm sorry. Uh, Jeremy. That's okay. There, there's so many Jasons and Jeremy. <laughs> I understand. I'm old and sluggish, you know. So bear with me. That. <laughs> But uh, what uh, what was I talking about now? Reno and Smiley in Smithfield. Yeah, yeah. I wish we could get a hold of Tom. He could. There was a, he has a pretty good uh, story about that. Did you see them on the on TV, Dan? Did you get the WDBJ station down? No, but uh, you know, I was going to ask Jeremy about. Are there TV shows of the Cracker Jacks, Arthur Smith? Uh, he was a uh, Don Reno was on TV, you know, all the time. I just wonder if anybody's got those tapes. They are. They are supposed to be um, in Charlotte. Uh, Clay Smith, uh, Arthur had had all that stuff, and I say all of it. He had early footage. I know because uh, he had a television show on PBS in the late nineties called Then and Now, and uh, I remember seeing. Uh, David Deese on there and Arthur playing uh, feud and bangers out of G interestingly, rather than C. Uh, and they put out a, some tapes and such. Uh, and on one of these VHSs they sold, my grandfather bought it for me cause he'd watch PBS around, around 97 or so. And, uh, I, I got it for Christmas one year and you put the VHS on and it starts with all this old footage back in the, uh, behind the scenes there on the uh, the set at WBT and it, it goes by pans by and there's Don Reno shaving and, and looking wow. in the mirror shaving and black and white footage it, yeah. it, had, it was it was in the 50s uh you know probably I, I just the look of it I would say it was probably 53 54 and um so mm -hmm. I know there's footage from from that show then but um I just you know, I don't, I don't know that it'll ever, ever get out, but, uh, it's, yeah. it's down there in Arthur's stuff. <laughs> wow. Um, hey, uh, Jan, I've, I've just pulled out one of these other tapes and I was listening to it a little while ago while y'all were talking, I muted my mic. Um, yeah. it sounds like a live show and a, a guy, maybe, um, Jeremy might know from up around Galax, Jimmy Arnold. Do you ever know Jimmy, Jeremy? I never met Jimmy, but I, you know, I know of him, and I know yeah. some folks in that area that were friends with him. Yeah, according to Butch Robbins, so uh, when Monroe was seventy, uh, and uh, I, I don't remember what year Jimmy was was born or anything, but they, they uh, you know, Monroe, he he wasn't, he wouldn't back off, you know, if it was a ch opportunity to fight, you know. Somehow, somehow, they uh, set up a ring, and and you know, um, I don't know which one who challenged whom, but so <laughs> so here is like Bill Monroe, seventy years old, and then the much much younger Jimmy Arnold, and you know, 
within the seconds, if I recall correctly, a very short time, Monra had knocked knocked Jamie out cold. They had boxing gloves and everything. Wow. Uh -huh. wow. I hope so. <laughs> well, he was just like, Damn you imagine him breaking his hand or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the old Kentucky way, you know. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting bit. I just looked up. Looked like he um, opened up a tattoo parlor here in North Carolina in the mid '80s. I never knew that. I'm sorry, I missed that. What did, what did you say? I was just looking up a little bit of the history of Jimmy Arnold. And it said it looked like um, he opened up a tattoo parlor yeah, in North right. Carolina in if the mid '80s. See, yeah, if you see pictures of him, he's covered with tattoos. Wow. Very, very talented musician. Could play great fiddle and, and banjo. And, and he's from Galax. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was reading. Um, if you want to listen to a little bit of this live show, we can see um, what's on here if you'd like to listen to a little bit, Jan. You think it's Reno Smiley? No, no, no. This is Jimmy Arnold. Oh, so there, okay. There you <laughs> yeah. Go. Now, you know, this was, I was just going through the other tapes you said to go through and, and look at, and this was the first one I pulled yeah, up and put yeah. on. And, uh, sounded like that's what was on there, so we can play a little bit of there to uh, have a little longer show. Yeah. Get it going, or we will talk show. Outside of Rono. When he had the first bluegrass festival that was ever held. Carl. That sounded like Fred Barton's time. Yeah. That was a fairly short message. And a lot more people started to have festivals, and the musicians that were sort of on their last legs in terms of getting places to play started getting bookings again. And then last summer, we bought Carlton Haney, who's the man who had the dream, bought this park here in North Carolina to be the permanent home of bluegrass music because bluegrass music was like a little orphan child and didn't have a home. And I was just sitting over there looking across this crowd and seeing the people lined all the way back to the trees. And I can see Carlton Haney's dream beginning to come true because bluegrass music now does have a home and bluegrass music has its supporters. And I think that bluegrass music is never gonna die and I think that you people are the ones that are responsible for that. Of course, Bill Monroe's the one who's really responsible for it. He started it in 1939. And Carlton Haney's the man who's made bluegrass festivals uh, pops possible. Next summer, there are 40 bluegrass festivals planned all across the United States. And I believe that the gentleman that I work for and that all that it's made this festival possible this weekend deserves a great big round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, Carlton Haney. Yeah, man. <laughs> He's a great man. And he's been real under the weather this weekend and hasn't been able to make it out here. We hope he does get out tomorrow because he will put on the Bill Monroe story tomorrow afternoon. That'll go about four hours in which Bill Monroe will sing with some of the fine singers that he's sung with during the years. And that's, of course, the highlight of this Labor Day weekend Bluegrass Music Festival. Right now, let's continue with the picking here, because that's what we're all here to, to do this weekend, listen to picking. I've got another fine band, and I know we're going to have to move that microphone down again. They come from around Galax, Virginia, which is the seat of old-time music in the Galax Carroll County area of Virginia. And they picked some fine bluegrass music, and the banjo picket that was out here just a minute ago with Joe Green was an original member of this group, and he's going to be out with them again tonight. Jimmy Arnold and uh, Wesley Golden and the Virginia Cut-Ups. Let's get them out. That is so cool. Wow.
Thank you just a whole lot. I'd like to say we're glad to be down here at Reeds for we at the Bluegrass Festival. Our next now we'll like to call a bass player around here, Wayne Golden. He's my father to help me sing Wayne Tyler. Ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> Gonna miss me when I'm gone. There ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. Once you wrap these birds upon my headstone, there ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. What's my hell loving, sweetheart? How'd a dear leave? We planned the day that she would be my home. Some other man that's going all in from me. Now there ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. There ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. There ain't nobody gonna walk me to love. Won't you wrap these birds on my headstone? There ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. Once I had love and mother and your old daddy. And now they're in the land where angels dwell. They found eternal rest way up in heaven. We're all by my reward, but walk in hell. There ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. There ain't nobody gonna walk me tonight. Once you got these words on my head, there ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> You've been patient, kind, and true, me old lover. You're the only one that's never done me wrong. And for so while I'll pet you, hit old lover. Cause there ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. There ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. There ain't nobody gonna walk me to love. Once you wrap these birds on my headstone, there ain't nobody gonna miss me when I'm gone. <laughs> Thank you just a whole lot. Before we do another number, I'd like to introduce the boys in the band. This boy here playing the mandolin from Cana, Virginia. His name is Paulie Gray. Let's give him a big hand. Boy back here on the five-string banjo. I guess you seen him out here a while ago. His name is Jimmy Arnold from Freeze, Virginia. Let's give him a hand. Man back here on the bass. He's my father. His name is Wayne Golden. Let's give him a hand. Up here done all the talking and the lead singing his name Wesley Go and that's all good them big. Our next now we'd like to do one we have a lot of requests for when we play in appearances around Wayne Tyler Freeborn man. I was born in the Southland 20 some odd years ago. I ran away for the first time when I was four years old. I'm a freeborn man. Never put a back road, never mind a railroad track. Got a gal in Cincinnati. Got a one that's in that town. I love the girl lives next door, but any place is home. My free born man. My home's on my back. I know it ain't the highway. Never put a back road, never mile or a road track. I 
know it ain't the highway. Ten foot of back road, air mile of rifle rack. I'm a free born man. My home's on my back. Well, I know it ain't the highway. Ten foot of back road, air mile of rifle rack. You'd listen to if you Jimmy Martin like. <laughs> Thank you just a whole lot. For next night, we like to call Jimmy around here to kick us off on Wayne Tiles, sitting on top of the world. It was in the spring, one summer day. My sweetheart left me, she went away. And she's gone in her world. Where I'm sitting on top of the Golding, you know, who, who later was a member of uh, Boone Creek with Ricky Skaggs and Terry Bauckham, Terry Douglas, yeah. and uh, yeah. Bryant uh, on the bass, Jimmy Bryant. Was it? Steve Bryant. Steve Bryant, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that was interesting, and, uh, you know, I don't know a whole lot about um, Jimmy Arnold's picking. I wish I knew more about it, but it seems like, and uh, Jeremy can attest to this, and just that southern part of Virginia, southwest Virginia, just a hotbed for for pickers. Um, what What's your take on, on the picking in that part of the country, Jeremy? Boy, there's a lot of good ones. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I never was all that familiar with Jimmy Arnold's playing, but, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of people that knew him, and uh, actually, you know, so much of my information and knowledge and stuff comes from relations to to don reno because i just been ate up with don's music forever but you know there was an album that uh that don and and charlie moore did together for wango uh, which is ray davis's outfit up there in fallen waters west virginia mm -hmm. and uh, jimmy arnold actually played banjo on those recordings so uh Ray Davis liked Reno's guitar playing. So he wanted Don to play guitar. And I guess, I don't know, I guess Jimmy was maybe up there in that area at that time of the DC area or something. Anyway, I don't know how all that went, but uh, Jimmy Arnold played the banjo on it. And golly, it's a really, really good album. And yeah. uh, man, Jimmy just, he knew, he knew how to drive it and right where to put the, the groove of, yeah. uh, of his roles, man. It, it's really good. I, I had some of his, or I have some of his old albums, you know. Mm -hmm. Very competent. I played great fiddle, too, you know. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I wish, like I said, I wish I knew more about him and his picking. That's just uh, <coughs> pretty neat stuff. I never know, knew about that um, recording with Reno, so I'll have to look that up because I love Reno's guitar playing uh, pretty much just as much as his banjo playing, in my opinion. I just I love them both. Yeah, yeah he's great. Now, I always like that album too that Reno cut um, with uh, Tony Rice playing on on those tracks on yeah, the Byron Berline. Yeah, on the A part of that album, Family and Friends was where 
Tony was playing guitar. And then, of course, Don played guitar on that album, too. And it just uh, some some super pick. And I'm sure you're familiar with that album, Jeremy. Yeah, I mean, Don was sort of in his I – mean, he aged fast, really. But, uh, you know, I would so I would say he was in his twilight years. Of course, it was right just within a year or so before he died. So his picking yeah. wasn't as strong, you know, as it – had been in the past, but um, but it's still good. You can tell, you can tell what he was. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, Tony Ray Billy Constable. He, um, of course, knew Don real well, and uh, he talks about that album. And, and Don actually came to stay with them several days at their house out in California because they recorded that album somewhere out there. And uh, so that was just a really neat time. Don coming out there, and uh, uh, it's kind of like you know seeing home folks way out away from home out in California. Really interesting. I never knew that. See, I, that would have been a, a reason to have tried to interview uh, Billy at some point, but I missed that, you know. I, I didn't know he was out there in California. Yeah, him and his family lived out there a good while. And, you know, his mom and, and Charlie Moore were married there for right. a while. And, uh, I don't know if that was when when they were married. I, I Maybe Charlie was dead by that point because that was the 80s, right? Yes, that was 83 or 84. Yeah. That's what I thought. But uh, he said they did a lot of jamming that weekend that Don stayed with them. I'd, I'd like to have been a fly on the wall for some of that and the stories that went around the room. Oh, yeah. You better believe it. Wow. Uh, I, I remember talking to Tony Race about that album, and he, I, I don't remember much, but he, he said he, he had a good time. It was, it was a good atmosphere. F fun uh, recording, of course. It's probably a yeah. Tony had a lot of respect for Don Reno. Yeah, he did. Um, what was the last album that Don cut, Jeremy? What was would have been his last recording? Well, I'm pretty sure um, that Family and Friends was the last one, but there it seemed like there may have been a few cuts that he had done on. Um, for Ray Pennington on Step One Records, and then the boys maybe finished that album out. And mm -hmm. that album is called, um, oh gosh, I hadn't thought of that record in a long time. Uh, I can probably put my hands on it here. Um, That's right. Ray Pennington from North Carolina. He wrote the number uh, Cabin in Caroline. Wasn't it? Yeah. Da, 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 da. Ralph Pennington. I'm friends with her daughter, Vivian. I was talking about Ray Pennington. He was a producer for King Records. Ray Starr, he's often referred to, and he came to Nashville, and then mm. he's actually the one that produced that album of Don that uh, we were just talking about, a song for everyone from Monument Records. And mm. uh, Ray just passed away this past year in a house fire here in Nashville. Oh, my, um, oh my God. Uh, let me. I'm still over here looking for this album, and I'll tell you the name of it in a minute. Yeah. It's so cool to talk to people who have this depth of knowledge. Yeah, he. he, he Jeremy's got a lot, a lot of it, a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. No he doubt speaks, about that. Speaks well too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Don Reno's whole life was full of music. He didn't have a long life, but it was full of music. Now, he, wa he wasn't old at all. I, mean, I think in the 50s, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he died, what, 1985? I, he died yeah, in uh, October so. of 84. 84. Yeah. I think it was October how, 15th. Yeah. How old was he, Jeremy, when he died? He was uh, born in 26, in so he was... Uh, my math's not well, too good. Fifty-eight. He was fifty-eight. Yeah, I'm thinking it was fifties. I I thought he had a congestive heart in the seventies when I met him. You know, he had his belly was starting to swell, but nothing else. But yeah. I guess he had a lot of health problems from the military. You know. Yeah. He had a, Is that a true? variety of things. I I'm, I don't know so much about that. Um, I think he just had a lot of stuff that sort of came crashing down there all at once. Yeah. Um, they've, I've heard so many different things, and, and honestly, I have stuff written down and in interviews, and I haven't distilled it all down to exactly you know what was going on that I can't even 
remember the details of exactly what happened there at the end. But that that album, I was trying to. And there's people that would say, Jeremy, I can't believe you can't remember that name of that album. Well, I just hadn't thought of it forever. The final chapter is is the record, and it came out on Step One Records. It was actually released in 1986, uh, as I'm looking at it here. But uh, Don is on um, quite a few songs on there, if not maybe somewhat on all of them but the album wasn't done and then the boys finished it yeah yeah getting uh in in his later years i know he still had the rb75 he played the uh, spelling some in the later years is that right jeremy he did he played that and he also played a um a banjo that was built by c.e ward um who i think ce was from down at charlotte area somewhere down he there. was y'all, yes y'all probably knew C knew ce but uh um he played that banjo a, a whole lot really almost exclusively until it got stolen in um i believe in 83 they oh. um had gone to um they it was several of their instruments were in their van and they had uh, gone to eat or something at the ground round there in in Lynchburg, uh, Virginia, and somebody broke in and stole a bunch of stuff out of the van. Wow! And, well, I guess none of that stuff's been recovered yet. Has it? I don't. I don't think so. Wow! That'd be interesting to see that banjo. CE was was great, and I believe he did some work for um, Sonny and Bobby Osborne. Is that right, Jan? Yeah, I'm not 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 familiar with that. I know C built and did a lot of banjos and did a lot of work. So the you've probably seen pictures of this banjo and didn't realize it because he had it was basically a a replica of Don's seventy five. Um, the only thing is, is there were some minor details that that C did not replicate, and one of which was he didn't put Gibson straight across on the peg head, so mm -hmm. it's angled as a normal like a standard three would be. And uh, so, you know, if you look at it and you see pictures with it uh, angled like that, you'll know it's a C.E. Ward banjo. So. Mm -hmm. now, one thing about Don's banjo that I always thought was interesting, that his original 75 is that piece of the flange missing. Isn't there some story with that? Something happened to his banjo where it fell or something? I never did know exactly what happened uh, for sure on that, but Doug Hutchins has more information on that than anyone I've ever encountered because apparently <clears throat> that flange uh according to doug is the act actually the original flange that was on posy roach's banjo mm -hmm. and i guess posy came to doug at some point and had broken that little piece out of the flange and doug had an original flange and he put on posy's banjo and then he kept that flange and don apparently just really tore up the flange on his banjo and doug had the posy roach flange so he put that on don's banjo and i think the flange that doug has on his banjo now is the original flange that was on nelly and if you ever see a picture of doug playing his original flathead there ain't hardly any flange i mean it's yeah. um, it's broke out halfway around you know um, so suppose that's what doug says but you know he's the only one that, that has that information and and of course, you know, people would, a lot of times would be skeptical. Would just one person have the have the information, but he's the only one that would have it because he's the one that had the flange, you know. So um, that's a pretty interesting story. That's pretty pretty obscure. But I think he's written about that on the Banjo Hangout, so it's it's documented out there somewhere. You know, I I I really want to get uh, Doug Hutchins on this program. You know, yeah, so Doug's great. Yeah. yeah, he's a wealth I, of knowledge. Yeah, I know it, and I, 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 I've contacted him, but I never heard back from him. But he, he knows so much, and about all those bluegrass boys reunions, you know, he was behind that. He's done a lot. He promotes the music. Yes, indeed. And the history and the memories. Yes, he sent me those Bill Monroe pictures I have. Yeah. Well, um, the drawings. Yeah. Now, Jan, on C. E. Ward, you have my album. I had a C. E. Ward album, and I think, I think you've got it now. And it's got Jack Lawrence playing Ruben's Train on it. Okay, I, I, uh, I, I know the name. I mean, I recognize the name. 
Yeah. He's from Charlotte. Yeah. And Jack Lawrence was like 15 years old and played the heck out of Ruben. Now, I bet. I bet he played it uh, cra kind of the crary way or. Well, it was his way at that time. I think Jack refined it, got, you know, a lot better like everybody does, but he was a hot player at 15. He sure was. And, and you see Ward influenced Jack. He, I'm sure he influenced a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Jack was, or is a fantastic player. Mm, yes. He knows a lot of different styles, of, you know. I used to well, enjoy him very much that when they played uh, Doc and let's see. He was a full partner with Doc. They split everything. Jack yeah. said to me one time, he said, when you go on a trip with Doc to California, you show three shows. They didn't even have to advertise. Every show sold out. He said, but guess who has to do everything? <laughs> because yeah. Doc was blind. You know, he said, you think people want you to blind men? think again yeah. promoters always say i didn't do this i didn't get that you know jack would have to do the haggling he was a smooth guy he's yeah. a good instrument repairman too he worked on volvos huh that's it that's yeah. yeah hey Jan, i think uh, what i'll do that this tape that we've got on there now that we listened to a little bit i think we'll save the rest of that for for next time if that's okay and yeah We'll listen to that. That way, we've got something new for next week or whenever we get together, and uh, yeah, we'll do that. But it's it's really been good. To, I wish that uh, Reno and Smiley interview would have been a little longer. It sounds like there was more to it. It's just the whole tape wasn't there. Uh, yeah. So hopefully um, that'll turn up somewhere in the other tapes you have. Yeah. Well, that we need to get Jeremy to say he'll write down this stuff, write that book. Get this history down on paper. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. I need to do it. I need to do yeah, it. De definitely, definitely. Well, the The information, a lot of the information, at least, is is there. It's just got to be sifted through through for yeah. interviews and such. So, and yeah. it's a lot in my head, but I can't always pull it up. I'm not the best uh, uh, one at recalling things, but uh, it's all here. So. Now, yeah. Jeremy, who did you interview in Don's family outside of uh, the sons? Of course, did you go to like brothers, sisters, people like that? I did. I actually haven't interviewed all the boys. I've interviewed Ronnie a couple of times and I've talked to Don Wayne some. Never did an official interview with Don Wayne or Dale. So there's a lot of information there that I that I can get. I just haven't gotten around to. But I interviewed uh, Don's second wife, Betty, you know, Don Wayne and Dale's mother. And I've interviewed um uh donna k and Jean, which are ronnie's younger and older sister mm -hmm. um that's that's pretty much from the family who i've who i've interviewed um uh, got a lot of early information uh from ronnie's sisters and a lot of great photographs as well uh, mm -hmm. actually found the photograph that started all of that uh for me the picture of of uh Don Reno and my mentor, Troy Brammer at El Tenador skating rink back in 1950. And that was huge for me. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Wow. That was, that was amazing. So, um, and, and, and I interviewed a lot of musicians and people connected to Don <clears throat> from the, I really sought after early people that were, you know, soon passing away and that sort of thing. And, and I got a lot of folks that were connected to him in the forties. Um, mm. In, in South Carolina and North Carolina, and that's yeah. Something. Didn't uh, wasn't some of Don's family still in this or are still in this area here around Asheville, uh, North Carolina area? Yes, he's got he's got family in um, in North Carolina. Uh, there, you know, he was from uh, outside of Canton, uh, yeah. area, sort of Clyde and all that. Yeah, that's right. And uh, but he was really raised down in Buffalo, South Carolina. Outside of Union, there. So there's family down there as well. Union. What is the Union? Is it near Greed or somewhere or south of Spartanburg? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And did they just move there because of work? Um, they they did. Yeah. Yeah. Don was very very young. I, you know, I think a year or two old maybe when they moved to to Buffalo, South Carolina. 
Hey, Jeremy, there, there, there was like a some kind of a mu musician swapping operation going on there between the Stanley brothers and and Reno and Smiley. Well, <clears throat> was that some kind of a deal they had made or what? You know what I'm, I'm not, talking about? I'm not sure if I know what you're talking about. Well, you know, like uh, Bill Napier, for example. I, 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 I've noticed a few... A few few of those musicians would, would sort of play with the Stanley Brothers and then with, with uh, Don Reno and Smiley. I'm not familiar, really, of Bill Napier playing with uh, Reno and Smiley. Now, George Shuffler, he worked with Reno and Harold, um, you know, later on, like in 67 or 68, 69, I think, somewhere around in there. Yeah. But I can't think of any other crossovers between those two bands i i don't know why yeah i need to check my my uh sources a little better but uh i could have sworn that i've i've, I've seen that even written about somewhere mm. but uh but they'd be interesting a little mini project check yeah me. if you let me know if you you find where you you saw that because i'd like to know no I, I i used to hang around greenville south carolina back in the old days you know and so uh i met some people that knew uh don <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> chuck haney was one of them you remember chuck oh yes yeah. yep chuck chuck was an original tennessee cut up before Red Smiley, so you know he and Don played together way back, uh, yeah. back into the forties. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I played in some, you know, just jam sessions with him. It was when they told me he had played Arena Smiley. I, I was really, that with, with Don and Charlie mm -hmm. Moore. Charlie Moore also. Somebody was asking a question here, Jan and Jeremy may know. I've got this album here again, a song for everyone. And there on the uh, corner of Don's banjo head, looks like there's something written. Do you know what that is, Jeremy? Weather King. Weather King. Okay. So that was just the brand of the head. Yep. That was one of those early plastic heads that, uh, that they just stamped uh, Weather King on. So I don't know exactly when those date from, but uh, if my, anybody's got one, they'll sell. I'd 11 inch. I'd be very interested in it. <laughs> to be honest with you i may have one jeremy and uh, if i can find it you can just have it how about that well that sounds good <laughs> yeah i've got some old weather kings and i never used them because i got them from a friend of mine tom mckinney and uh they were in pretty rough condition some of them some have been used on arch tops so they had the ring around the uh, edge of the head there and i just never put them on anything so if you want one that's not in perfect condition and maybe on an arch top i may have one for you oh that'd be that'd be great and i like the ones with the big huge crowns too so oh i've got that so uh just go ahead and plan on getting one if you'll remind me I'll ship you uh, all right good deal i like it that <laughs> i got some but mine are uh i bought one on ebay a while back but it came cracked so if something happened in shipping and the box had got busted in, I was pretty bummed about that. I got my money back on it, so I got the head to look at, but I can't really use it. So <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I'll dig these out, and I'll send you some pictures, too, because I, I don't know much about which of the Weather Kings were good or not, so you can decide and see what you want. Good deal. Well, uh, fellas, I don't know if you had anything else we need to share with the people. No, I think we're, we'd be pretty much good to wrap up now, and like I said, save that uh, music that we heard a little bit of for next week. And yeah, yeah. From there. Well, we we started with Don Reno. Let's talk about last word on him. He was a great songwriter. You know, musical Bible for Road Mount way back forty nine or fifty. He was a good songwriter, among other things. Everything. Yeah. Yes, he was. Good, that, good uh, singer too, man. What was that? 
He was a good tenor singer. I thought. Oh gosh, he was. He was. That I used my Bible for a roadmap. He wrote that song back in about 1949 or 50 when they was traveling with Tommy Magnus, and uh, they had a car wreck or something up around Raynell, West Virginia, and um, had that song came to Don sometime around there, and and I think he said if uh, if you're traveling with Tommy Magnus, you better be using your Bible for a roadmap. And that's where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Don Reno was a Renaissance man. He, he did it all. He really did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, we, we're just going to say goodbye here and then we will uh, be back on a normal uh, time slot there at eight. PM Eastern Standard Time Thursday. So Jeremy, thank you so much. It's it's really I love I love the depth of your nerdiness and, and that you really, <laughs> in, in, yeah, I, I I love it, you know. And Jeremy's gonna write a book now. He's gonna write this now. Yeah. Lord willing. <laughs> I, I really pre appreciate you having me on here, Jan. It's uh, yeah great to it's great to meet you i've heard your name and i had uh, you know seen some about you a little bit but uh, i'm glad to actually uh, meet yeah. you as yeah. much in person as possible right now anyway right 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 I, i'm sure we have several mutual friends around the danville martinsville area yes yeah. you both love bluegrass yeah that's right Hey, uh, Jeremy, if you'll hang on the call after we go live, I'll uh, I'll pull out some of those heads and you can just look at them while we're here on camera. And let, me yeah, let me just uh, sign. Sounds good. Thank you, folks, for, for tuning in tonight. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you.